So in the novel, what's yeah, happening sorry, is, yeah. yeah, we're going to hear from this in a moment. What's happening is we have four parts of the novel, like the four Gospels, I suppose. Mm. Four different points of view. There's Mary, there's Judas, there is Caiaphas and Barabbas. But even the names I'm using now are all wrong yes. because they are, you know, the, the anglicized Christian names, whereas they have their Jewish names mm. in your accounts, and each of them gives their the views, Romanized their, names. Yeah, Romanized, yes. yes, yes. This, is, this, is, this is also... It's already part of the story you're telling, that they yeah. have their own identities, their own names, yeah. and their own language, indeed, yeah. from which they, you know, narrate these events. Yes. Shall I, shall I read you a yes. bit? Yes, okay. Yes. We're we going to hear now from the Miriam. Yes, yes. Part, so, uh, so, yes. So, I've called them their, their Hebrew names, Miriam and um, Yehuda, which would be Judas. Um, I left Caiaphas as he was. It probably would have been Yosef bar Kaifa, but um, mm -hmm. I quite liked him leaving him as he was because he was the, really the one who had to be in league with the Romans and doing what they said. Um, uh, uh, and uh, Bar Avo, Barabbas, um, who's the murderer, do you remember him, who's released yeah. when Jesus is crucified? Um, so I was, very, I was very thrilled when doing my research for this book. Uh, to read about um, the following event in, in Josephus. It's, it's an account of, of a, in fact, both of the things I'm about to read you are real things. Um, I, was, I was very thrilled when I read it to work out that um, whilst this thing which, which occurs in Josephus was happening would have been exactly the right historical moment for Mary, Miriam, to be in Jerusalem. She, this is something that happened in just a few years BCE. Mm. Um, so she would have been a young woman mm. Mm. ripe for marriage. Mm. And this is exactly the appropriate point when your father might have taken you with to go to the temple to, in Jerusalem to offer sacrifices. Uh, you know, and, and, and you might catch the eye of a young man, or a young man might catch your eye, and you know, this is, this is how business is done. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and yes, I was marvelously delighted to find that this really would have happened. Prob I mean, I think if there was such a man as Jesus, and he, and he was born in the year that, roughly the year that we think he was born, and his mother, um, mm was roughly the age that we would expect her to be, then mm. his mother was gone through, yeah. probably yeah. present at this. Yeah. Um, so they go to the temple to make, their, to make their sacrifices. This is what one does at the festival time. They made their offering in peace. Seven baskets of, fruit of, of the fruits of the land they brought to the priests figs and barley, wheat and pomegranates, olives and dates, and grapes dropping heavy on the vine. The pure white lamb was slaughtered, its blood scattered, its forbidden fats burned on the altar for the Lord. And they heard murmurings again as they left the temple. The men gave one another secret signs, making a hand shape like a dagger and whispering low and confusing words. Miriam's father kept a tight arm around her and brought his lips close to her ear. You see nothing, he said. You hear nothing. We feast with your uncle tonight and tomorrow we go home. When it happened, it was swift. They were walking past the spice market, homebound, and as they came in sight of the hippodrome, with its tall colonnades and its fluttering flags, she knew something was wrong. Her father's grip tightened on her shoulder. He stood still. Behind them, back the way they'd come, there was a tight knot of men walking slowly, but at a steady pace. The shutters on the buildings nearest the hippodrome were shut tight, were shut and closed tight with wooden pegs. To the right, up the narrow alleyway, another small group of men. Burly farmers with corded muscular arms, each with a long bag on his back. The soldiers on the steps of the Hippodrome were laughing. Two of them were throwing dice. The others had wagered money on the outcome. Some were on the lookout, most were watching the game. Miriam's father's grip was like iron tongs on her shoulder. They were in a thin crowd, some other parents with children or whole families, each looking as frightened as they. 
They walked into the Hippodrome Square, moving as quickly as they could without breaking into a run. Passing an open doorway, she saw that the dark room beyond was full. She had the impression of watchful black eyes, of shifting flesh, of the dull sheen of metal. Men had come to Jerusalem from all over the country for this festival. The thing had been planned. The day had grown over-warm and clouded, the sky off-white. The breeze faded away, the air was soft and moist as a damp cloth. A splash of rain fell onto the cream marble plaza, a heavy, ripe droplet which burst on the dusty stone. And then another drop, and then another, and as if the rain had been a signal they had agreed on long before, the men came. Screaming, they ran, dark-skinned and red-mouthed, letting every rasping breath go from their lungs with a cutting edge like their metal blades. Wild, shouting, anger howling, swinging their iron arms like free men whose home was overrun by vermin, they pelted up the steps of the Hippodrome and began the slaughter. The first guards, shocked by the sudden inrush, legs trembling, died before they had unsheathed their swords. Miriam saw one split from stomach to throat, a quiet, smiling man who had unloosed his breastplate in the hotness of the day. Another soldier went down screaming, calling to the garrison. There were arms around her suddenly, strong arms around her waist and under her shoulders, lifting her up off the ground, though she kicked and wrestled, pulling her back, gripping her close, and in her confusion it was several moments before she realised that the voice shouting in her ear, be still, be still, was her own father's. He ran with her as the rain fell more strongly and the men screamed, ran back through the crowd, charged at them with his shoulder, held her, close, held her pressed into, close into his chest so that she could only inch her face to the side to breathe and, with one eye open, see glimpses of those who pushed forward. They were smiling, hot blood grins. It was those soldiers who had taken their land. It was this man and this who had stolen their harvest, their women, their god. Miriam did not see where her father was running to, only that he was striving against the sea, pushing away from the place of blood. When at last they came to rest, and the noise was more distant, she saw at once that her father had taken two gashes, one across his shoulder and what, through the fabric of his robe, and one to his ear, which was half gone, the top sliced off and oozing dark blood. He had collapsed, with her still grasped firmly by one of his arms, on a pile of sacks. They were in a dark room across the courtyard from the Hippodrome. She tried to stand up, but her father pulled her back. Be still, he whispered, and fell onto, back onto the sacks. Clasped against his chest, Miriam could feel his breathing, rapid and shallow. His grip loosened, and she crawled out from under his arm, staying low. The shouting and the dreadful cries from the square were increasing. She saw a long trickle of blood run down her father's neck and, feeling with her fingers in the gloom, found a wet patch on his skull. He was still breathing, though. She put a palm in the centre of his chest to reassure herself of that. Still, yes. She looked about. They must be in a stable, probably for a priest's family so close to the temple. It had that clean smell of horse flesh and dry straw. They were just beneath the window, which was shuttered, but she pressed her eye up against a chink in the wood. Arrows were flying in the square. One thudded into the thick shutter, and she thought, what if one were to hit my eye? But she could not look away. The slaughter was endless. The soldiers at the Hippodrome had lowered the metal gate to keep the attackers out. They had the upper ground now, looking down the steps onto the mass of Jews running up towards them. They fired arrows through the grill, and she saw 20 men brought down as she watched, pierced through the stomach, the chest, the groin. Near, near to her hiding place, a man slumped with an arrow sticking out of his thigh. He tried to pull it out and screamed. He was young, she thought, maybe 18 or 19. There was a sheen of sweat on his brow. He looked around for a safe place to shelter. What if he came here? What if he opened the door and they were discovered? And if the soldiers came, what then? Another arrow found his neck with a crunching, snapping sound, and he fell back, dead. God forgive her, she was grateful. As she watched, the Jews, unable to sustain the heavy losses from the archers, fell back into the surrounding streets. 
The square in front of the Hippodrome was dark with bodies and running red, Roman blood and Jewish blood. One of the soldiers was still moving, moaning. She wondered how long his comrades would leave him there. Her father was still breathing. She moistened his lips from her water skin. He licked them. It was a good sign. It would be dark in two or three hours. Perhaps he would be able to move then. She heard cheering from the street outside. Were the Romans celebrating their victory? But the noise intensified, not a cheering, a rising again of raging voices, the clash of arms. She put her eye to the shutter a second time. From the roofs of nearby houses, the Jews had raised ladders and ropes and had hoisted themselves to the upper levels of the colonnade. From there, they had the upper ground and were throwing down rocks, bricks pulled from the structure itself. There were boys with their slingshots hurling down missiles. The more the Roman soldiers looked up, the greater the damage to them. She saw one man smashed in the mouth with a brick, his upper teeth gone, his, his upper lip gone, his teeth out, and the whole centre of his face pouring blood and gouts of flesh. The Romans tried to fight back at first. They sent their arrows upwards and even pulled some of the men down bodily and set on them with swords, cleaving their limbs and heads from their torsos. Probably should have warned you about this so early in the morning. <laughs> But the advantage of holding the higher ground was too great. The Romans withdrew, sheltering in the back of the colonnade. The centre of the Hippodrome, Miriam could see, was piled with the bodies of the fallen. There was a great cheering from the Jews on the top of the Hippodrome, a victory cry. Miriam couldn't see what the Romans were doing. The Jews atop the colonnade could not see either. She turned back to her father. His lips were moving. She wet the sleeve of her dress in her water skin and dripped a few drops onto his mouth. He swallowed. The stable was dark and cool. She leaned close to his lips. He was whispering, Run, Miriam, run to your Uncle Elihu's house, run now! She looked outside. The square was quiet. She saw a weeping woman walking at the edge to, to find a particular corpse and kneel, cradling a head in her arms. If she were to run, this would be the time for it. But if she ran, and soldiers retreating from the Hippodrome found her father here, they would kill him. At least if she were here, at least if she were here, a young girl, she could plead for him. She could not leave. The danger has passed, father, she said. The square is quiet. Rest, and when you're able to walk, we will go together. Run, he kept saying. Run now. His fingers and his legs were cold. He was shivering. Crawling on the floor, she brought more sacks and covered him. The shivering diminished. He moved onto his side and began to breathe more slowly and evenly. He was sleeping. A true sleep, not a faint. There was a sound from the square, like the sound of trees being felled. A great cracking sound. She wondered if the Romans had brought battering rams. There was a low, rumbling roar, like the sea heard from far off. She put her eye to the shutter again. The Romans had set the Hippodrome on fire. The bottom part of the structure was stone, but the upper floors and galleries, the parts where the Jews had climbed, were wood. And the wood was crackling flame like the altar of the temple, like the smell of burning sacrifices, the wood was on fire. She saw that a great host of men had retreated to the very roof of the Hippodrome, where the clay tiles were not yet aflame, but there was no way down. The ladders had burned, and no building was near enough to the Hippodrome to jump. They were going to burn to death there, on the flat roof of the building. Some of the men were clinging to each other, and some were on their knees praying, and some were shaking and tearing their clothes and hair. She saw one man take five paces back from the edge of the roof and run forward as if trying to jump to the next, but it was too far, and he fell to the stone floor and did not move again. There were others who joined him soon enough, jumping from the roof to escape a death by flames. She saw some, as the fire crept up the wooden structure, draw their swords and fall on them, and some did not jump and did not take a blade to end their lives, but waited or tried to climb down through the flames, and their cries were the loudest and most anguished of all. She had heard it said that a man who died as a martyr to Rome would be rewarded by heaven. 
The growling, unquenchable fire sent bright sparks up to the skies, and she remembered how the life of a lamb goes back to its maker, while the flesh remains here on earth. But the cries were so loud that after a time she could not think of anything else. The square between the stables and the hippodrome was stone, stone and marble. The flames did not extend across them. She watched through the night, ready to drag her father behind her, as if he could not, uh, if he could not move himself, and the flames jumped to the buildings nearby. But they did not. The soldiers had made a neat job of it. And the rain, coming and going, helped a little. The fire burned out whilst it was still night, leaving just blackened stumps of wood poking up into the sky from the stone base. Before dawn the next morning, Miriam shook her father until he woke, and, stumbling, dizzy, crawling sometimes, he came with her to the house of his brother Elihu. They stayed in her uncle's house then 17 days, not daring to leave, even to find food, or to hear the news of what had passed in Jerusalem. They had the well and wheat flour and dried fruit enough to live on, and her father grew stronger every day. He and her uncle agreed that they must not go into the country. The Romans would be looking for anyone who fled Jerusalem, guilty or innocent. Anyone trying to leave the city would be branded a criminal and a traitor, especially a man with fresh wounds showing. When at last her father was well enough to attempt the long journey, and Elihu had heard and understood what had happened in the city, they left. They went in the early morning. The soldiers at the double gate asked them what business they had, and Miriam replied, as her father and uncle had schooled her, that they were citizens of Jerusalem, and she was betrothed to a boy from the north, and they must attend the wedding or the dowry would be lost. The soldiers joshed amongst themselves and made bawdy jokes to her about her wedding night. She cast her eyes down, and tiring of the game at last, they let them go. It was only then that she saw what was to be seen. Along the roads to Jerusalem, the Romans had erected wooden frames. Two planks crossed, one over the other, a long upright and a short cross piece, making a shape like the letter Zion. There were thousands. They lined the road on either side as far as she could see, down the hill and curving round and to each frame they had nailed a man. The day was warm, the sun was bright, as if it knew not what it shone on, as if the Lord God Almighty, the Infinite One, <coughs> he who is everywhere, had forgotten this place. There was a smell of blood and the buzzing sound of flies. They gathered at the soft places, the ears, the nose, the eyes, and the beating wings and the low tearing grip of the vultures and the crows. The blood had trickled down the frames, had pooled at the bases, had dried in brown drips, and there was the stench of rotting flesh like a taste in her mouth, and there was the sound. They walked along the rocky path. The men nearest the city had been nailed up first, they were already dead, their bodies contorted, their faces and flesh already eaten away by carrion birds. As they went further from the city, though, they came to the more recently captured rebels. These men had been there three days, four, five at most, and it was they who were making the sound. The soldiers, she knew, were still watching from the parapets of the walls of Jerusalem. No man could be cut down until the prefect gave leave, and these men would rot here, and the flesh would be eaten from their bones by the birds and the swarming things of the air. For all that, those who still had tongues in their heads pleaded for mercy, for a sponge to their brows or a swift sword to their throats. They cried for their mothers, she remembers. This was where she learned that all dying men call out for a mother, no matter what they said or thought before. Do not look up, her father whispered to her. Do not stop, do not hesitate, look down, walk on. So she walked through the valley, beshaded by the screaming trees. This was the message of Rome to the people of Israel. There are things which are too painful to think of, and she tries, she struggles constantly not to think of it. 
but she cannot make a day pass without remembering those men calling for their mothers. She knows what a man calls out when he is nailed to a crossbeam. She should have forced him to come home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very powerful. <laughs> very, very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good. There we go. Yeah, yes, yeah. Rome. They were Rome. not nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, you know, the street, you know, thousands of crosses and yeah. crosses. And that's what she sort of grew up with. Yeah. It's a stunning image. So that, that, image. Is, yeah. that is 100%. That, that event definitely happened. Mm -hmm. We know that, um, that uh, well, Josephus tells us, and, and, yeah. and, and it's, it's certainly extremely plausible from other accounts we have, yeah, yeah. that um, the Romans crucified 3,000 men in a single day after this rebellion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 3,000 men. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and I suppose knowing that from, from my youth, um, it always struck me as a bit weird to have <laughs> the, to, one, yeah, the one the, cross <laughs> is focused yeah, on. Yeah, the one, yeah, the yeah. one guy, yeah. and then and you just go, no, but look, look at this. So you've really done, as you say, historical research, Josephus mm. and other sources. What sort of material were you using to reconstruct this world and you know, make it so vivid, so concretely realised? Yeah, so... Um, uh, uh, Josephus is very good. Um, the, uh, I actually, when I was a teenager, um, you guys do baccalaureate, right? Mm. But uh, we have A-levels, which is more like focused, so you only get four yeah, subjects. Yeah, we know what that is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I did A-levels at the same time. In, yeah. uh, no, I did, I did Latin and Hebrew. Oh, okay, you've which, got the languages, yes. Yeah, which yeah. the languages is all you need, really, I yeah. think. Um, I mean, I'm lucky my father's a historian, actually, so mm -hmm. uh, I had a little bit of that growing up, just, you know, that kind of discussion. But... Um, uh, it was, it was actually, it was when I was about 17 that I got the idea for writing this book. Um, so it's I, been a while in the making, yeah, really. Really, yeah. like I, I, I mm -hmm. said to my Hebrew teacher, when we first ever looked at sort of little bits of Jewish writing about Jesus, I said, oh, somebody should write like a Jewish book about the Jewish, mm. like mm. what Jesus was if he was a Jewish figure. And mm -hmm. my Hebrew teacher said to me, oh no, nobody should write that book. <laughs> that would be terrible. <laughs> but you kind of, yeah, you kind of been, you know, carrying this project with you yeah. ever since. Yeah, yeah it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, um, I, I think it's really helpful to be able to read yeah. work in the original yeah. if yeah. you can. It means yeah. that you can mm. um, detect ambiguities of meaning, mm -hmm. which are quite yeah. helpful. Yeah, linguistic sources and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did use the Gospels. Yeah. You know, yeah. one has to well. take the Gospels with a pinch of salt. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> but it is, yeah, but it is, you know, the received account of what, yeah. We, yeah, what we have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and. But, you know, Josephus really is, a, is also an amazing source. I mean, I don't know a great deal about mm. him, but he actually, I mean, he started off as a Jewish rebel and indeed yeah. a military leader yeah. before eventually kind of changed yeah. sides so and he defected to yeah. the Romans. So that's the very tricky sort of, sort of go-between figure in this, in this conflicted field, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, I like those, yeah. like those go-between yeah. figures. I yeah, like, like translators, really, yes, in, in exactly. many ways. Yeah. Like, and I always, I've thought of myself as this for a long time because I grew up in this, you know, way in which people don't necessarily really anymore, or or not like that. I feel myself to be in the role of a translator sometimes oh, to that's kind very of interesting, yeah. you know take yeah. people from who who we might want to think of them as as being so like us and just mm. go. There are ways to understand and points and and but also to recognise the differences. I start yeah. start this book with critics consistently describe this book as visceral. Right and in there. fact, and in fact, it starts with some viscera. Yeah. So I, sacrifice. Yeah, there, yes. Yeah. yeah. So it starts with a sacrifice of a lamb because I thought, mm. if I could, if I could persuade my reader in the first two or three pages that the sacrifice of a lamb is a spiritual act, mm. a vital act, something that has tremendous meaning to it and and which feels very important. Then they would understand. Then, then suddenly you would be inside that mindset, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, and, and and not to be in the yeah, sort of squeamish yeah. 21st century mindset yeah. where we want That's, our yeah. like chicken breasts presented as if they were tofu fillets. Yeah, no, it's know. really <laughs> bloody affair. Really yeah. bloody affair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, again, to open up a moment, just, but just want to point out one thing that's what's really striking is that, you know, the, your book came out two years ago, mm. but last year Colin Toybean published The Testament of Mary, where he also attempts a kind of, you know, a kind yeah. of account from Mary and, of course, you know, Jame Coetzee wrote The Child of, of Jesus. Yep. So, you know, all kind of following your lead. Oh, I'm and sure. It, they read my book yeah, and they thought, they, ah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you really 
hit on something there. So I'm absolutely intrigued. They say you're carrying on this kind of project. Oh, yeah. Do you want to know what the others will be? Well, it's going to yeah. exactly my question. <laughs> yeah. What so, so this one, this is very, very close on the life of Jesus and people who yeah. knew him. The next one, um, a little bit further out, will be um, uh, about the rivalry between Paul and uh, Jesus' brother James. Do we know that Jesus' brother James was the head of the church in Jerusalem? Mm. Um, and he, James, James did not, was not necessarily in favor of this taking the, the ideas of Jesus out to the non-Jewish world. Paul was very sort of, we ha, you know, we have, to, we have to spread this message to the whole world. And James said no. I mean, and they, ha, they had a variety of, like, conflicts, including that um, James... Uh, James thought you would have to be circumcised to be a follower of Jesus. Yeah. And Paul's like, no, no, no. Any, anyway, so um, they, then there were physical fights between them. They, they, and, and obviously, now you, you know who won, because who's ever heard of James, right? <laughs> 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 yes. um, okay. But, so I, but you know, of, yeah, excavating yeah. the other presence, yeah. Excavating what, how this happened, basically. So this, this is a book about really kind of about the life of Jesus, kind of. Um, but mostly about the time of Jesus, yeah. actually. Um, then, then one about how Christianity became something that was um, broadcast to the non-Jewish world, not, not and mm. to, grew from being a Jewish cult to, a, to something that went wider. And then I think I have one about Constantine, which is just really an embryo at the moment. Okay, so that's yeah. when Christianity really so hits the big time. Yeah, so it's 300 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. becomes yeah. a state religion of Rome. And I think a lot of what you see in modern Christianity... Yeah, I mean, not, not, I don't want to tell you what your Christianity is. If you are, if you are a Christian, obviously, you must tell me. But um, I think what one has seen, certainly in, in some of the actions of the church over the generations, have been more the actions of a state religion, of, a, of an organ of the state, mm. than the what... Romans then eventually made it, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, look, to me, why do, I, why do I want to talk about this? I think this is the origin of antisemitism. Um, I think I think the New Testament and the way that it was used by the Roman Empire, that sort of mm. that that nexus mm. is is where antisemitism comes yeah. from. You yeah. know, in places in the world where the New Testament really never really caught on, there's xenophobia, but there's not the specific Jews, Jews, Jews. Scapegoating. You know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. so, and I feel like sorry, I'm just talking and talking, but I, I think up, yeah. <laughs> I think. There's, there's, there's a thing where we, could, we go, oh, what is this terrible mystery of antisemitism? Where does it come from? Oh, it's just a mystery. It's just a, a disease. In the, and you know, actually, the only reason one ever thinks something is a mystery is because one is afraid to look at the source. Mm. You know, you never mm. find the thing if you're, not, if you're afraid to look in the Funching exact, it, yeah. exact mm. place. And the exact place is to go, well, there is antisemitism in the New Testament. There are reasons for that. You know, the, the early Christians did not have a good time with the early Jewish population, with the, with the Jewish population at the time. Um, it was certainly, if you're going to spread a religion in that time, you, um, under the thumb of the Roman Empire, which is not a nice empire, um, you're going you're gonna to do much better by um, saying that uh, uh, it's all the Jews' fault than to say it's all the fault of the Roman Empire. You know, it's much like like that's going to be a much mm. more politic mm. way to describe what happened. And you know, that's, thus yeah. and thus and thus and yeah. the, and the history of Western civilization. So, yeah, yeah I think it, it feels like important to talk about it. I'm afraid that's an opinion. Where's Howard? <laughs> <laughs> well, are we talking about yeah. a novel though? Okay, responses rather opinions from the floor. Okay. Roland Weidel and then, yes, okay, come on. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, this refers back to uh, the earlier part of um, your interview or your dis discussion regarding your reading of Falstaff. Mm -hmm. And I totally, I'm with you that actually Falstaff is a tragic character. You suggested that, f or you said Falstaff is, or you suggested that Falstaff is a tragic character because he does not understand hell and he does not accept the fact that mm. hell is not the way he actually thought hell to be. I would maybe suggest a slightly different reading. I think Falstaff is tragic because he understands and he does not want to accept it. I mm. think the tragedy lies in that gap between understanding, he's quite aware. I think even the first part of Henry IV, you have that uh, scene where they rehearse the, the interview between yeah. Hell and his father and Falstaff plays Hell and speaks on his own, on Falstaff's mm. um, uh, part. And he says to the king, basically Hell playing the king, uh, oh, there's um, 
I have a friend, um, I, I forgot his name, I think it, it's, it's Ford stuff. Um, please, do, do not banish him, do not banish him. And all that um, hell, as his father says, is, I do, I will. Oh. And you do not really know, does he say, I will not banish him? Or actually, yes, yes. I will banish him. Mm -hmm. And this, this mm -hmm. ambiguity, you, you said yeah. just now something about the ambiguity of meaning. And I think there you can see the gap. And I think Falstaff, right from the beginning, has this double awareness. He knows, but he does, desperately does not want to accept the fact that actually Hal is always seeming and playing. And I don't know whether you saw the, the Hollow Crown adaptation. Mm. Simon Russell Beale yeah. as, as Falstaff and Tom Hiddleston as, as Hal. There's this one close-up and we just see Falstaff's eyes yeah. and I think there you can see he knows but he just doesn't know what to yes, accept. Yes, that it. exact thing. The things okay. about the people yeah. that we love that we know but we don't want to know. Yeah. Actually, it's exactly the same as what we are just talking about. Yeah, yeah. We kind of know yeah. but we just turn our, we turn yeah, our faces away. Eye, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that Good is point. just, I, I find those things kind of miraculous and fascinating in the human spirit, you know, that often after the event we can see that we knew right from the start how it was going to play out, but mm -hmm. we didn't want to know. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I have this slight suspicion that maybe writers are better than average at doing that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because, we're, because, because we, we live in fictional worlds anyway, maybe we're quite good at self-deception. Thomas, yeah. Yes, um, um, have you read... Hello. <laughs> Um, by um, Sealot by Reza Aslan um, oh, it came yes. out last year. Yes, uh, I have. In fact, I reviewed it. Uh, okay, oh. wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because he got uh, immensely attacked by uh, Christian scholars and uh, also fundamentalists. And my question is if, how you liked it and if you had um, similar problems from the Jewish community or from... Yeah, mm. Christians. Mm. <laughs> okay, so I loved, I loved that book. I'm, I, at the time that I read it and then reviewed it, I thought, oh, if only this had been available when I was researching my book, that would have cut <laughs> a couple of years off. But at the same time, I think, no, there's a value to going back to the sources yourself. Um, it's it's great, a really great Rita Aslan's book. And, and really, you know, for a sort of n a nice afternoon's read where you come out going, oh, now I understand the history of Western thought in this way. That's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, so... What have I had? I had a bit of anti-Semitic email when the book was first published, which was solved by my taking my email address off my website. Mm, mm, um, mm. And, and now there's my agent's email address there, and apparently um, uh, 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 vicious anti-Semites don't want to email her and say, listen, can you pass on to Naomi that, that Jews control the media? And <laughs> um, so, so that, that, that hasn't happened. Um, anymore but I mean probably there are people out there but I haven't had anything terribly vicious but then you know um, the reason Aslan had that like particular one interview that then kind of went viral on the internet so sometimes these things just happen um, from the Jewish community uh, I have been condemned both and I, th I consider this to be a point of, of pride <laughs> I've, I've been condemned both by the ultra orthodox um, who wrote uh, that my, n my first novel, uh, which has, has a lesbian relationship in it. Um, <laughs> so, so people say, oh, you must have known it would be controversial. I'm like, I just wrote about people that I knew and the lives that they had anyway. Um, so the, Ju the, the Jewish Tribune, which is an ultra-Orthodox newspaper in, um, in the United Kingdom, said that my novel is a gross contribution to the realms of sordid literature. <laughs> oh, <that's a> <laughs> pride, yeah. okay. and then and then and then i had a neo-nazi website which said um this novel proves as if novels could prove anything novel proves that jews are biologically driven to corrupt even their own <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and, and i thought well i could get a t-shirt with one on the front and one on the back <laughs> 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 you know, and I feel like as long as I'm upsetting these kinds of people, I'm doing the right thing. Yeah, you know? yeah <laughs> certainly, certainly. It's great, thank you. <laughs> Do you want to read us have just a short passage of the battle? Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, time is slightly pressing, but I'd oh, love, yeah, sorry, us, I'd love us to hear up. just a short passage from another voice from that novel, the voice of Barabbas, yes. as we know him who is a rebel leader and in many ways a very strong concluding presence to that project and that's yeah. what we'll take to round off, I think. Okay, so, so we're going to go into 
Pro well, like a like if not the same riot, then a roughly similar riot. This book, I I I have to confess to you, is composed mostly of massacres, riots, and fucking. Yeah, lots <laughs> of sex in there. Yeah. Lots of sex. Yes. Yeah. So you know, this will probably give you a sign of it. <laughs> yeah, just a short passage. Yeah. Um, let me. Okay, here we go. <laughs> This is exactly what we've been talking about. The thing, so, so this is Bar Avo, who's a young man. He's about 14 or 15 years old. He's been, they've been throwing stones at the Roman soldiers. The Romans have responded, um, and they're kind of trying to like, goad the Romans into attacking them more so they can attack them, and they draw them into territory where they've got an ambush prepared, and they're having a whale of a time. Um, <laughs> the thing turns from comedy to violence and back again, as swift as a knife. One of the flaming jars of oil hits a soldier. His leg, and arm begin, his leg and arm begin to burn, and his screams are hideous before his fellows smother him with a blanket, and even still he whimpers as they carried him off. A red-headed boy is caught by the soldiers, and as he struggles to escape, one of them pulls out a sword and cuts off somehow, in an awkward, close-fought struggle, three fingers of his left hand, so he is suddenly howling and bloody. And yet, over here, Bar Avo is climbing, clambering between the buildings when a goat rushes out from a backyard enclosure, panicking at some small fire, and hurls him to the ground so that his friends laugh and point and howl with mirth. He picks himself up. His pride is a little injured, and he makes up for it with a brilliant scheme, luring the soldiers down an alleyway with taunts, then scrambling up the wall with, with his friend's help, while from the rooftops, the others pelt them with rotten fruit from, in a box they'd found left over from the market. There is no conclusion to the battle. It goes on like this until nightfall, with the soldiers making sudden rushes, capturing a few boys, and the boys throwing stones and sometimes fiery things, and sheltering in houses and shouting rude slogans. A storage barn burns, and they watch the flames together, fascinated by the slow, crumbling tumble of the building folding in on itself. The fighting peters out before dawn, and Baravo has still not been caught. He has had a good riot. He was one of those young men throwing fire bottles, but they did not take him. Although a soldier had his leg at one moment, and, another, and at another he scaled a wall to find a soldier waiting for him with a red, shouting face on the other side. He and Giora helped one another escape through, the, through a soft place in the roof of a cowshed, and then patched it up so that the soldiers who followed, them, who followed them in could not find them. Giora laughed so much that he fell to his knees and almost sank through the roof again. There were girls watching them, and there was much pretense of protecting them, even though the girls could easily have got away. But they nonetheless stayed on that roof, playing at being protected. And after sunset, as the day began to grow dim, and the sky was the colour of bright blossom shriveling to black, and the night sounds of the mountains began to rise up, the soldiers slunk away back to barracks. They were dragging a captive or two, but went so sudden, sullenly, and having taken so little, that the boys shouted catcalls behind them, and the girls whispered, you won, you really won. There were two sets of hands around Baravo's waist in the dark, and two sweet, pliant bodies pressed against him. And the girls did not seem to mind sharing as the night closed in and their hot mouths found him ready. That is his first riot, and it seems as far away from death as it is possible for any experience to be. When he wakes the morning after, his head so clear and alive that he feels that God has made the sun to rise inside his own skull, he wants to do it again and again and again, and wishes with his whole heart that every day would be a day of climbing and shouting and throwing and goats and manure and backflips and oil jars, and that every night could be like the night that has just passed, sweet and warm, and that every morning for the whole of his life would be like this blue radiant dawn. Oh, you've given us something to dream of yeah. for tonight <laughs> at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, thanks a lot. You've really taken us a very long way, all the way from Falstaff and Bottom to yeah. Miriam and Baravo. <laughs> and this at 10 o'clock in the morning, I think we all need to cool down now with some coffee. Excellent. Yes. Enjoy. Wonderful to meet you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. It's fantastic. <laughs>